All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It is Webinar Wednesday here with Can Do. Um, we are looking forward to today because this is part two with Stephen McCoy. We are so honored that you are here, that you're lending us your your knowledge, but also your valuable time. We understand, you know, coming to meetings, breaking up your day. Um, sometimes can be hard, but so we feel very honored that you are here, and we feel also very honored that you all have joined us this afternoon. So hope you're doing well. I know um, we're just coming off of um, a full moon. Grandmother Moon was out on Saturday evening, and there was that really powerful energy. Sometimes the emotions can be, you know, like more so during the full moon. So I hope you had, you know, a good weekend, a good beginning of the week. I hope today, uh, you know, you acknowledge that you are part of Creator's world that you are right where you belong. Sometimes along our journey, we have that struggle, we have that uncertainty, but at the end of the day, at the end of that breath, we belong to creator's world. We're part of this beautiful, you know, masterpiece. You know, we're part of this web of life. We're just a mere strand, but we are surrounded by all of our relations, all of our relatives, the animals, the plants, um, the waters, you know, beautiful mother earth. So we just give thanks before we get started. I think it's always important to just take that moment to take that gratitude from the heart center, from that heart space. And just give thanks for a couple of things in your life, you know, food, clothing, shelter, friendship, but maybe get a little specific. You know, I woke up this morning, very tired, but when I went outside, the sun, the sun, the sun was shining. And right there, you know, creators meeting me for another day. Creator meets us, you know, when that sun rises in the east. So give thanks. And um, we just honor creator in all that we do. So welcome, welcome. So this is part two with Stephen McCoy. Last week, he talked about starting a business. And there was, you know, if you missed that session, I would highly recommend because there was a lot, he is, it was packed full with a lot of information, a lot of good knowledge. And so even if you are, if you have a business for someone like myself, I already have a business established. Um, this presentation, this webinar was so beneficial. It just reminded me of things. It gave me some tangible pieces that I wanted to work on. So regardless of where you are in that journey of entrepreneurship, this is a, a, an amazing webinar. So this is part two. So we're going to explain the, or not we're, Stephen is going to explain the importance of developing business plans and examining the main elements that go into the design of a business. So it will also explain how to gauge the potential success and risks of business and invest the prospective target audience, market size, competition, and the ability to secure a portion in the marketplace. So, you know, I, I always say that, you know, we belong in creator's world. You know, whatever we hold in our heart, those dreams and those, you know, plans that we have belong in creator's world. But we also have to put in the effort. We also have to do the research. We have to... Um, build the capacity for our own business in our own selves, perhaps in our own nation and organizations, so that we can show up the best way in creator's world. Um, so a little bit before I pass this virtual mic, a little bit about our guest speaker. Um, he is an Ojibwe member of the Garden River First Nation and is a lifelong resident from the city of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, he is the member of Makwa Bear Clan. He is the CEO and founder of Gen City Inc., which evolved from his own part-time consulting business. He started in 2012. Then he rebranded his business into Gen City Consulting in 2018, 
which he recently incorporated into Gen City Inc. in 2022. Oh, I think that this is remarkable and congratulations. Gen City was awarded Indigenous Business of the Year in 2021. That is exceptional um, from the Sault Ste. Marie Chamber of Commerce. Commerce. That is a great, um, a great, I bet that's a great story to share uh, and to hear about. So Mr. McCoy specializes in marketing, communications, consulting, public speaking, events management, Indigenous and Indigenous liaison. So in addition, as if that wasn't enough, he is a journalistic writer who highlights Indigenous leaders and in business and entrepreneurship across Canada. And he works with various First Nation communities, associations, politicians, nonprofits, organizations, and large pro private corporations. Okay, so this guy is bringing a lot of wealth and knowledge and I'd say expertise to the table today. Um, again, we're honored that you are here. Uh, I thank you so much and um, feel free to use that chat box, put in any questions that you might have along the way, because there will be opportunity for you to have the discussion with our, our guest speaker today. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Welcome. No, thank you very much for the warm welcome once again, Michelle. Uh, very happy to be here, and I just wanted to acknowledge and say thanks as well to the CanDo team for bringing me aboard. Uh, very excited and always willing to help out and share my knowledge with the group. And so I'm excited uh, you could all join us for today. And as mentioned, uh, today's workshop is going to be a part two of a part one series, but uh, don't worry if you missed the first part. Uh, this is kind of, uh, you can also just participate in this workshop and you don't need all the elements from the first workshop to, to catch on what's going on here. It's going to be about 40 to 45 minutes in length and we'll have some Q&A time at the end as well. So I do ask if you do have some questions along the way, just please drop them down and make note for the end of the presentation to ask those. So again, here's a bit more about myself as well and who I am, uh, just to I, I like we already explained Gen City um, as my business currently. That's my main operating business where I do most of my uh, work through. Indigenous Biz is kind of a side project where I like to, as mentioned, highlight Indigenous people in business. And it is a good way to brand myself as an Indigenous person in business and to generate leads as well for myself. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that I, I have on the go. As an entrepreneur, I also have other things going on in the background. And as you meet more entrepreneurs along your journey, you'll realize this is a common thread among them. They usually have multiple uh, multiple things on the go. Uh, for example, I also do have a billboard advertising business uh, going on. And I also house hack. Uh, house hacking is um, I bought my house off reserve. Uh, about eight years ago, and it has an in-law suite upstairs that I rent out, and that covers my mortgage, my utility bills, my insurance, plus some. Uh, so those are just a few of the things I'm involved with um, as an entrepreneur. Like I said, you'll notice that when you meet more and more entrepreneurs, these have multiple things, multiple businesses on the go. So that's just a bit about me and who I am and what I'll be doing or uh, what I've done to help bring you some knowledge today. Quick recap of what we went over. As Michelle mentioned, uh, the three topics I touched on in last workshop was a self-assessment about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. So I threw a lot of stats at everybody. Some of the main stats that stuck out to people, I think, were the um, stat about 30, only 35% of businesses survive to see year five, and 20% of businesses do fail within the first year of opening their doors. And one of the main stats as well, uh, the main reason why businesses fail is because there is no market for the product or service that they're trying to sell. Also set some expectations uh, for everybody as well as entrepreneurs. Uh, they're sacrificing a lot of time. Again, uh, a lot of people seem to think that if they start their own business, they're going to have all this free time to do what they would like. But that's not the case. Back to the stats. If you happen to make it to year five and survive, then yeah, you will start to notice your time free up. But until that time, you're dedicated to your business 100%. It's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and uh, just touched on, set those expectations uh, for everybody if they're thinking or are, are along that starting journey of becoming an entrepreneur. Also touched on what a value proposition is. It's basically 
what are you going to sell and why do people want to buy it? And you have to be able to sum that up quickly for people because that's the first question anyone's going to ask you when you do open a business. So what's your value proposition? Why should someone want to buy the product or service off of you? What benefit do they get? What utility do they get? What problem does it solve for them? So you need to be able to answer that quickly in a value proposition. And I also gave a starting checklist as a guideline, uh, something to help guide your journey along the way. There was no hard and fast rules to follow, just more of something to help guide your decision-making process along the way. So if you haven't uh, checked it out, please do. Uh, it is recorded and available on Candu's website. What we're going to be talking about today, as Michelle did touch on, what the elements of a good business plan are. And a good business plan... Um, is is sort of like a playbook so if you have a good playbook you can uh, adjust on the fly and adapt as you go and i'm also going to touch on the importance of a market analysis and feasibility study and all the elements that go into that and how to perform those uh, type of studies as well so getting started on to the uh, what elements of our a good business plan and so having a good business plan is a key to help guide you along the way so here are some of the elements of a good business plan. Now, actually, before we get too far into the weeds of it, I do want to make a disclaimer about business plans and entrepreneurs, because you will notice this the further you go. Many entrepreneurs actually don't write a business plan, and they actually don't have one. Um, I am myself one of those people that started out, I didn't have a business plan. Um, I had a plan and a, about a business in my head, but I didn't have it all written out. And you'll find that a lot with entrepreneurs. I think the reason being, and this is my own personal opinion on this one, the reason being is when it comes to entrepreneurship, a lot of the times uh, to get funding for what you want to do is not available. Uh, you have to go to a bank for a loan or you have to apply for some sort of grant. You have to meet criteria um, that they'll outline. And a lot of times the business you might want to start is a part-time online business. Well, many funders won't, won't fund something like that unless you're dedicated full-time. Why? Because they know the stats. They know investing in business and startups is not a great return on their investment. We just saw the stats. Uh, so they want to make sure that they're doing their due diligence. Um, so the reason for a business plan mostly is so you can secure funding. Uh, if you need to go to the bank to get funding or you have an investor that's willing to invest in you, they're going to want to see that you thought this out. They're going to want to see that you, you planned some things out, that you thought about some risks and pitfalls and how to avoid them. And that's what a business plan is, basically. So when I used to write business plans for small entrepreneurs, um, that's the majority of the time they would come to me. They usually had a business already established, and they usually wanted to grow it or get some additional funding, but the, the lender wanted to see a business plan. So that's when they came to me to actually get a business plan now put together. So just I want to put that disclaimer out there. If you Once you get into the uh, entrepreneurship world, if you notice a lot of entrepreneurs don't have business plans, don't be surprised. It's kind of common. But it is pretty important to have one because it'll help guide your decision-making process. And like I said, it'll help also secure funding for yourself. So here are the elements that I had up there. And just to get into them one by one, an executive summary. Oh, one more thing too about business plans just to touch on before. There is a traditional business plan versus a condensed business plan. And a traditional business plan is just usually longer length, a lot more detail into it, starts around 20 pages, can go up as high as 80 to 100 pages. It all depends on the business, uh, how in-depth um, the business is. Is it a vertical type integrated business where you have a lot of uh, manufacturing to production to sales and you're owning all of those along the stream? Well, you're going to have a pretty lengthy business plan for that. But if you're just using one stream, like say at the end of sales with a small store, you can get away with having more of a condensed business plan. I've seen business plans now that are condensed straight to one page summaries with just some appendices attached. Uh, you can do that these days. And the reason being is people have short memory spans. So one of the first elements of your business plan is going to be an executive summary. Executive summaries are always at the start of your document. They're short, they're succinct, and they're to the point. Most people, uh, business people uh, especially, they don't have time to read these lengthy documents. Um, so you need to be able to capture their attention with as little as possible. So think about like the music industry. We've all seen the examples or movies or heard the stories where a guy goes into the booth to audition, start singing for five seconds, they cut the purse off, say, okay, great, you sound good, do you want the job? 
they didn't need to hear him sing the whole song. They didn't need to hear that person sing a whole album. They just needed to hear a piece of it, the key pieces to make sure they're on t- on tune and on key. And that's what people want to see in your business plan. They want to know that you're tuned into the market, you're tuned into your product, you're tuned into your customer. They want to know that you, you, you've done your research on that. So that's part of what a business plan is. And you're going to put that into your executive summary. What's the key products and services that you're selling? What's the market size? How do you plan to capture a piece of the market? Who's in the space already? Um, what competitive advantage do you have over your competitors? And what's your financial projections? Uh, how much money do you plan on making? How much is it going to cost you along the way? Um, so you want to be able to summarize that all into a quick executive summary, which is consistent with maybe three or four sentences in a paragraph that should take up no more than a quarter to a third of your, your, your page, really. So that's an executive summary. It's a pretty key point and element that captures the attention of your readers of what your document is and uh, what the key elements of your business is and why it's going to be beneficial for the marketplace. So products and services. This one's pretty straight up. What are you going to sell? What is it? Is it a product? Is it a service? Is it a mix of both? Under this section of your business plan, you want to include your offerings. You want to explain your line of offerings, um, what the benefits those products or services offer to your your target market, um, and what problems do they solve. Uh, Those are key. Again, back to the first workshop when we talked about uh, the, the number one reason why businesses fail, which is there is no market or there's no demand for what it is that they want to sell. So, uh, so you want to make sure that your product is providing or filling a gap in the market for consumers. Um, if it's a new product or a new service in a new market, um, you need to be able to still describe what the benefits are going to be for the customer or what problems it does solve. Those are usually key when it comes to whatever product or service that you're selling. Most entrepreneurs will identify a gap in the market and they're either trying to find a product or service themselves to fill that gap. They can't find it. So what they end up doing is creating it themselves. That's an entrepreneurialistic mindset that you'll find a lot more on your journey as you go. So products and services, uh, you need to be able to define and describe that in your business plan. It's a key part of your business plan. Next part that's pretty important is your marketing strategy. Marketing strategy actually uh, involves a lot more than just promotions, uh, but it does uh, involve a lot about promotions. Marketing strategy is how do you plan to promote and sell your product or service to the marketplace? So one of the biggest things that you're going to have to figure out once you have your product, uh, your value proposition is who's your target market? Who do you plan on selling your product or your service to? You need to know the demographics of your market. So let's say you have a product that's geared towards younger uh, younger generations, like say 15 to 21 year olds. If you have a product like that, you need to know everything about that demographic. How much money do they have to spend? Uh, what's their education level? Um, what's their motivators? What, what's their fears? What's their drivers? Uh, what makes them you know, excited? You almost have to be a psychologist and figure out all of the demographics of your target market and explain why uh, your product or service will be suited towards them. So that all goes part into your marketing strategy. Second is branding. So what's the name of your company? Uh, what's the logo? What's the color scheme? What's the feeling you get when you look at the logo? Is it more of a some of a slick kind of hip logo that's geared towards the younger crowd? Or is it a conservative, um, more um, cleaner logo that's designed to attract in more older crowds? It's again, going to uh, depend on your target market, who you're trying to market your product or service to that will drive your branding. So your again, your name, your logo, your color schemes, and your value proposition are all going to be based off your target market and who you're selling to. So that's very important to define your target market because it, it kind of leads and opens the door to these next steps here. And next would be, what is your pricing strategy? So once you've got that figured out, uh, what are you going to price your product at? 
how are you going to figure that out? You need to have some sort of pricing strategy. So a lot of that is based on your, for example, if you're selling a, a product, you're going to have to figure out what your cost of goods are. So what, how much does it cost you to get that product? Then from there, you can figure out what you're going to sell it for. And the difference between the two is your profits. So you can, for example, if you can sell, you want to sell cat food. And let's say you got some a source where you can buy a skid of cat food for 20 cents a can, and you can turn it around for, say, a dollar a can. Well, the 80 cents difference that you're making, that's part of your profits. Um, that's after you've paid for your cost of goods sold. Um, you still haven't paid all your other bills yet, but that's that's a starting point and it's a price strategy to look at. Your price strategy, also you want to benchmark. So what are the competitors in the marketplace selling the same product or service for? Uh, you can use that to try and create your, your pricing strategy as well. Perhaps it's on a markup percentage base. So you mark up your services or your product by, say, 30% uh, based on what you bought it for. So you need to be able to define your price strategy and how you came up with the pricing for your product and service. Uh, some services are uh, and things are easier to figure out. You can just look up online on what your competitors are charging and you can bring your, pro your pricing in line with theirs. Some things are harder to figure out. For, say, the consulting business, it's a lot harder to figure out what someone like, say, myself is charging their clients because I don't post uh, my rates publicly and many other consultants won't either. Uh, that's something you're going to have to kind of gauge and research on your own and figure out what can the market handle? What are people willing to pay for my services? And what, where, what's the point where it gets to be too much and where they stop paying? So, again, pricing strategy is pretty important because it determines basically, if you're going to be able to make a profit or not. And what is your market penetration strategy starting out as a new business? How do you plan to get into people's face and, and penetrate into the market? Is it a new marketplace? Well, it's be a lot easier to slide into that space as if there's nobody else there, because you'll be the only one. Um, so you don't have to put a lot of thought into a market penetration strategy. However, if you're trying to enter a market that's very crowded already, well, how are you going to stand out amongst the crowd? Or is it going to be a pricing strategy where you undercut and drop your prices? Okay, that 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 is a strategy, but you're going to drive down profits for everybody in the market by doing that. Is that what you really want to do? Um, are you going to, say, spend a lot of money up front on marketing online to order to capture and get your brand awareness out there? That's a, that's a market penetration strategy. You have to be able to figure out what's the best avenue and what's the best way for you and your marketplace. And again, that comes down to researching both your, your market, your capabilities, and yourself and your product. Now, how do you plan to promote and raise brand awareness? Uh, again, so, so you need to be able to market and let people know that you're there. So let, let's look at McDonald's, for example. Every McDonald's knows that you know where they are. Like we all know where the closest McDonald's is to us at this point in time. But McDonald's still spends tens of millions of dollars on marketing. I still see new billboards for you know McDonald's promotions and things and just all the time everywhere around my town. Why? Because they want to raise their brand awareness. They want to be always in the front, forefront of your mind. They're trying to promote their business to you. In order to do that, you need to spend money on marketing and you need to get into people's faces so they remember that you're there. So how do you plan to promote your business? Are you going to be using a, a mix of traditional and new marketing mediums? So say TV ads and online ads. Are you going to be all specifically maybe traditional marketing, say radio ads and billboards? Or is it going to be all online digital marketing that you want to do? The website, social media and Google ads? It all, all depends, and that's something that you'll need to figure out. But it all goes into how are you going to promote and raise your brand awareness. And finally, where will you be selling your product? Are you selling a physical product and have a physical storefront? Well, your location is going to be um, significant, and the, the choice, like, your choice of location will, will impact a lot of your sales and how people feel or uh, about your business. So if you're looking for a storefront type business and you're expecting a lot of people there, do you have parking that's 
free nearby? Do you have available parking? Is it easy to get in and out of your business? Is it on a high traffic area or a low traffic area? These will all affect um, your sales and your product. Are you gonna be just strictly online? Are you gonna have, uh, if you're gonna have a website, uh, who's gonna build your website? Are you gonna do it yourself? Do you know all the elements that go into selling online? Uh, and if you are going to be selling online, again, who is your target market? Is it going to be just people in Canada? Is it going to be people across Canada and the U.S.? Is it going to be people across the world? Which countries are you planning on selling your product to? Again, that's knowing your target market and how you're going to be reaching them. Uh, so these are all the things that you're going to want to think about when you're putting together uh, your market strategy. So moving on to our next point, feasibility study. I'm just going to touch briefly on this because I have touched on it further along as well in the workshop, but feasibility study is basically the likelihood of you making a profit from selling your product or service to the marketplace. And you'll find there's four types of studies usually conducted when it comes to marketplace. There's technical, economic, legal, and market analysis. And for the purpose of our workshop and for my uh, specialization, we're just gonna focus on the market um, feasibility studies at the moment. But do, do realize you do have other options out there. So the technical uh, one usually assesses a company's capabilities to execute on a large project. What's the capacity of the business? What's its facilities looking like? What kind of raw materials do you have available? Um, what kind of supply do you have to those raw materials? What other inputs go into it? This is a really heavy on the manufacturing side where you would see a technical feasibility study. So let's say you're manufacturing some sort of product. That's where you would take a lot of this into assessment because it's, it looks a lot at your technical capabilities of the company. The economic um, uh, uh, feasibility study looks at and determines the financial capabilities of your company. Uh, how easy is your company able to access capital? Uh, what's the capital cost of operating your business and starting it up and operating it on a daily basis? What's your return on your investments? You need to think, think about your cost benefit analysis. We'll go here. Uh, you'll be doing forecasting as well in your business. So you need to say, hey, at the end of this month, I expect to get X amount of profits at the end of this year. I expect to have this total amount in sales. And at the end of three years, this is where I expect to be pulling in this amount of sales and how big I expect my business to be. Uh, what's your break even point? So after you put in and paid for your cost of goods sold and paid your bills, what's the point that it's going to take for you to break even? Is anything after that, if you make a dollar, you're coming out ahead. You're doing a lot better than a lot of people. And financial benchmarking, that's again, looking at your competitors uh, in the marketplace and seeing what they're doing with their finances and how much income they're able to make. And you're able to be benchmark your numbers to theirs. Uh, pro forma financial statements are just forward thinking statements. So when you're developing those, they're just what you expect to be at in the future, similar to forecasting, um, but they're kind of like a snapshot in time. I'm not an accountant, so I don't want to get too far into that. I'm more of a marketer, uh, but these are parts that will we'll, we'll go into the economic side and your cash flow and balance sheet as well. These are terms that you'll see more and more of as you get into the entrepreneur and business world. Um, so you do have to get comfortable with those terms and what they are. Of course, there's the legal side which looks at the legalities. Um, what are you responsible for? What are the pitfalls? What are your liabilities of operating in this space? And then the market, obviously. So that's what we're gonna focus on here. We do an industry overview of the market, uh, which includes a SWOT analysis and uh, market research in there as well, which we will touch on. So again, financial planning is how do you plan to finance your business and the ongoing operational costs? Um, so for that, you need to know uh, where your seed capital is coming from and what, how much seed capital do you need and how much working capital do you need to keep your op business in operations and any other capital requirements that you will need. You need to figure out what your costs are going to be up front uh, and put that into your business plan under the financial planning section. Again, you need to project your costs, estimate 
what's all of this going to cost me? I'm going to have to buy product. I need to get a computer. I need to get a new phone. Uh, maybe you need to lease a, a storefront. Well, what's that? What's the cost of leasing in your area? Uh, how long are you going to lease it for? And what's the cost of internet and keeping the lights on in that in that business? These are all things that are going to go into your in your costs. Cost of goods sold. Well, how much does it cost to get your goods? Uh, maybe you're an artist and you do beadwork. Well, how much do all those beadworks is going to cost you? How much does the leather cost you? How much does the thread and the needles cost? Uh, that's all part of your cost of goods sold. Uh, equipment. What kind of equipment do you need? If you're an artist, uh, do you have a sewing machine? Uh, you're going to need tables. Uh, do you need um, storage units for all your beads? I know a lot of people who've turned their whole basements into their beading room. There's a lot of equipment that goes into it and that you'll that you'll need. Uh, labor is part of your cost. So are you going to have a, additional help off the bat? Do you need to hire a couple store clerks? What's the minimum rate, wage rate or what kind of wages are you going to be paying your workers? And that's all going to be part of your labor costs. Are you going to be using them and bringing them on the payroll? Or are you going to be contracting them out and having them invoice you? Because that's going to determine how you set up your business as well. Because if you're on payroll, now you've got a whole lot of other technical things to get involved with. You have to have your business set up for payroll and you have to have a lot of things lined up for that. You need to identify your sources of income or sources of capital or where you're going to get it. So if you need to finance your business and you don't have the money to do that, where are you going to go to get it? Uh, you're going to go to the banks. Are you going to pull it out of your own personal bank accounts or savings? Are you going to turn to family and friends? Do you have a line on some grants or possible funding there? Or do you have an angel investor that wants to invest in you? Is it going to be, it's usually a combination uh, of all of these as well. So, but you need to figure out where you're going to get the money uh, to finance your operations and your startup. And again, you need to project your expected revenues and profits. So again, know the difference between what a revenue and a profit is. Uh, I, when people say, hey, I, you know, my business made a million dollars in revenues. My first reaction is I was like, that's great. What'd you make a profit? And then you'll see sometimes People will be like, oh, I, I lost like 50 grand. It's like, ooh, well, you know, that's great. You brought in a million dollars in revenue, but if you lost 50 grand after paying all your bills, um, there's something wrong there. Uh, you might need to rethink, you know, the, the plan, basically. So always know the difference between revenues and profits and uh, be careful of people who go around saying, I made X amount of money in revenues. And they, you know, they don't tell you what the profits are. Always ask what the profits are. Uh, and you need to figure out your own business as well. So what are your expected revenues? How much money do you expect this business to make? And after you pay all your bills, how much profits do you expect to have left over? That's all going to go into your financial planning section. Budget is also part of your financial planning section. Budget is just an assessment of all the assets that you have now. So how much money do you have now for your capital? How much cash do you have on hand? Uh, do you have any property that you're willing to donate to the business or contribute to the business? Or are you going to be buying a property for your business? Some people, they, they buy the storefront instead of leasing, they buy the whole building. I know many people uh, around town here that buy the building that has a, an apartment upstairs and they have their business downstairs. And that's where they live and breathe, eat and sleep is just in the one building. But that's part of the property uh, that will go into your, your, your budget and your asset breakdown. What kind of supplies do you have? That's all going to be part of your budget. Inventory, trademarks and patents. Do you have any of those? Are you an inventor? Uh, for give you an example of trademarks and patents. Those are harder to define a cost to. It's more subjective uh, to put a cost, but th there is um, a benefit of having trademarks and patents. And you will see these in people's uh, financial papers where they say, hey, we have a, a trademark on this and we consider it to be worth $50,000. Um, for example, Indigenbiz, the logo that you see down there, I have a registered trademark on that. And I came up with that logo and that design, that name probably about four years ago and started the whole process of getting it uh, a registered trademark in Canada for it. And I actually had to enforce that trademark uh, just recently. 
Uh, I recently had a, a gentleman who was following me on online for a long time. I noticed he started to use my hashtag, you know, indigenous hashtag. And then uh, sure enough, not too long, within about a year of him doing that, he launched his own business that was very similar to mine. Uh, same name almost, same logo, same design, same concepts and offering the same types of services. And he did not speak with me yet. He knew who I was. He was following me, um, didn't speak with me at all, didn't ask or anything or didn't want to partner up, just wanted to try and take it and undercut it. So I had to get my lawyers involved to enforce my trademark. So that's part of being an entrepreneur. Uh, and you want to make sure you have trademarks and patents in place as well, because they're assets. And I'll show you the benefit or the consequences of not having one as well. I will share another story with you. A client of mine that I worked with early on, he invented a ice fishing, um, an, an ice fishing rig where they automatically set the hook when a fish bit. It was called the trigger. And the moment I saw this, this, uh, this product that he invented, I was like, wow, because I automatically seen the benefit. First thing I asked, I was like, okay, it's like, do you have a patent on it? And he's like, well, I started the patent process, but I didn't finish it. And then it expired. So now it's, it, it's open now. So he, he didn't capitalize and utilize to get the patent. So we still went ahead and I still helped him with the idea, but there was no way to protect, protect himself. That's an open patent on the market that anyone else can easily replicate. And there's no way for him to stop or enforce it. So patents and trademarks they're especially important especially if you're a creative native and you come up with a lot of cool things uh you want to make sure you understand how to get trademarks and patents as well because they're assets and as well investments maybe you, your business has investments that's usually for a larger uh type company uh, where they have so much cash that they start making investments but we're probably not going to be there yet but it is an asset Again, projected income and expenses go here. You need to know your profits versus your revenues and it involves estimating and what percentage of the market do you expect to get? So you need to know your market sizes. So a lot of people are gonna wanna see this in their finances and budgets uh, when it comes to market size, which we'll also touch in a minute. Um, I'll just wait till we get to market size, I think to finish about the rest of the finances. But these are a lot of the things you wanna think about for when you're coming up with your budget and your financial planning. So those are the main elements that go into uh, a business plan. Uh, those are the main things you'll find. Uh, you'll find sometimes more stuff in business plans, but those are some key elements that you'll find in most business plans. So moving on, we want to look at, say, doing marketing and feasibility studies. And I know we're getting short for time, but this will be a little bit shorter here on this, I swear. So market size. Market size is important to determine because you need to know the market that you're planning on entering. Is it a new market? If it's a new market, it's gonna be a lot harder to find stats on say the size. And you might have to do a lot of primary research of surveying um, and whatnot and doing a lot of investigating on your own to figure out what the possible market size is. However, if you're getting into an established market, those numbers are probably readily available. There's already been a marketing company out there that's gauged the market size and, and or there's already readily available information through chambers of commerce or uh, labor boards of the Canadian Labor Board, US Labor uh, Board that will have these stats available and say, hey, for example, uh, I'm just gonna throw, make some stuff up here. But for example, let's say you wanna sell the cat food. I'm gonna use the cat food example again and you researched it and they say, the cat food industry in Canada is worth $100 million, right? Now, if they say it's $100 million and you say, I, I can capture at least 1% of that market. Well, 1% of $100 million would be $100,000. So that's what you would put in your business plan. You say, if the market is worth this much, I plan on being able to capture a percentage of that market, which would equate to this much dollars in revenues. So that's why it's important to um, understand what your market size is. And this ties back in as well to our uh, demographics of a target market. You need to know your target market to order to determine the market size. How many of your target market members make up this whole market? So it's important to know the size of the market that you're going to be selling in. It determines your supply and demand. So if you have a large market out there, uh, that's great. You'll probably have a large demand, but you also got to look at the supply, which comes into the competitor analysis. Um, 
So if you have a large market and you've proven that, the, yeah, there's a large demand, that's great, but how many players are in the space already? And that comes down now to leading into the next part of doing your feasibility studies is you need to have a competition analysis done. You need to know how many other players are already in the same market, selling the same services or products that you are. And this comes down, you, you want to know and include direct competition versus indirect competition. Well, what is that? So, for example, let's say you want to sell bottled water. Bottled water and other people who are selling bottled water in that same market would be your direct competition. You know, bottled water versus bottled water. However, if there's your indirect competition would include pops, uh, juices, chocolate milks, uh, energy beverages, all the other things that people could have as a beverage instead, that would be your indirect competition. Uh, with knowing your competition, you, you will look at their pricing. So this will help you as well with your pricing analysis by looking at what the other competitors are offering the same services or products for at what price. Uh, the market that you're getting into, is the product or service easy to replicate or not? Uh, that's going to determine uh, your ability and your, your competitive analysis or advantage, which we'll talk about next. Um, how many competitors can the market support? So that's another important thing. For example, right now, if you wanted to open up, say, a marijuana uh, shop when you're selling marijuana, does your market, can it support another, um, you know, marijuana or a cannabis store? I know here in the Sioux, we have so many of them now, and I don't know how much more of them, how much the market can take. I already seen a couple headlines in the news just today of uh, major cannabis companies that are claiming bankruptcy because they have so much product that they can't sell it. There's just so many players in the space now. And so you want to be able to research that. You can't just be like, uh, put blinders on, be like, hey, everybody likes cannabis. I'm going to open up a cannabis shop too. Because I even thought about it too, but I looked at the barriers of entry and I knew, I knew that everybody and their dog was going to be able to have a cannabis shop open soon. So I stayed away from it because I didn't want to get into that market because it was going to be too crowded. Um, but those are one of the examples that you need to be able to, to know how much uh, can the market, how many competitors can a, a market support? And are you ready to defend yourself against competition? If you are come up with a new product or a new service that nobody else is offering, that's great. Uh, you, can, you can start in the market. You don't have to worry about competition to start. But believe me, once you get into that marketplace and you've attracted some customers and are starting to make sales, other people will take notice. Other people are going to come along and say, hey, Steve's the only one in that market and he's doing quite well. Look at the car he drives. I'm going to start doing the same thing he does. Uh, you know, so you're going to have copycats come up. Just think about the example I just gave you about Indigenous. When I came up with that name, I knew it was pretty cool. It was pretty unique. And I came up with a logo and I knew there's going to be copycats out there. So that's why I put a trademark on it. So these are some of the things you got to think about as being an entrepreneur. You're going to have competition. Competition is going to come after you. You're going to have to go after competition. Are you ready to compete? That's part of being an entrepreneur. And what's your competitive advantage? When you're stepping into the marketplace, what makes your product or service unique from the competition that's not easily replicated? That's a competitive advantage. You know, if you're hopping into a market, say, selling t-shirts and you don't have any design patents or anything, you're just making common t-shirts. Well, there's nothing stopping me from getting a, a t-shirts and a press machine and doing the exact same thing you are. There, that's a very low barrier of entry. Um, and it's not really making your business that unique. What is your unique defining factor that differing, differentiates you from the rest of the competition? That's a competitive advantage. And good businesses always find what their competitive advantages are. And they usually don't go into a marketplace without one. Like I said, you don't want to try and enter a marketplace without some sort of competitive advantage because uh, someone could just come along and easily replicate what you're doing. And then you can have a marketplace that's filled with copycats. And that's, that's a tough, tough goal. So you always want to have some sort of competitive advantage to your business and in the marketplace that you're operating.
So again, remember trademarks, patents, those can be huge advantages when it comes to a, a competitive advantage. And feasibility studies and the best way to conduct these. Well, to conduct feasibility studies, uh, you may have to do some preliminary analysis. Again, what's the supply and demand of a market? The market size, capabilities, and your capabilities as a company. Uh, what's your capacity? Uh, what's your ability to have funding and grow? Like, what's your access to capital? These are all part of your preliminary asset, uh, assessment when you're looking into the feas feasibility study. Again, you want to prepare some projected income statements. You want to know what you're going to be making, how much on a day, which is how much in a week, how much in a month, and a year. You want to have these um, laid out into your income statements and your budgets as well. So people want to know that you've thought about what it's going to cost you and what you could possibly make um, in this marketplace. Uh, you might have to conduct some primary research um, versus and use and utilize secondary research. research. So when I say primary research, what I mean by that is you're conducting the actual research yourself. You've created surveys, you've gone out door to door, you've conducted focus groups, and you've collected research and some uh, data, and you've, been, uh, you've analyzed that data. That's primary research. Uh, secondary research is basically utilizing someone else who's already done all of that main research for you. And you can usually get that information um, online or for a small fee from some major uh, marketing uh, companies as well. What's your operational plans and procedures? People want to know this as well. Like, what's your operations look like? Uh, so if you have a storefront, what's your hours of operations? What days are you going to be open? Uh, what setup do you have in your aisles when people walk in? Uh, these are all part of your operations and procedures. Uh, what's the procedure for cashing out every day? Do you have financial controls in place for your business? Uh, these are all going to be part of your operations. So people want to know that you've thought about all aspects of your operations as well, and you need to put that and conduct that into your, into your feasibility study. Again, balance sheets, um, assets versus liabilities is basically what's good income, what, what's bringing you in money, and what's worth value versus what's a liability what's costing you money what's how many invoices do you have to pay what's your labor costs what's your cost of goods sold uh to do feasibility studies i always recommend people utilize the software that's out there these days as well so there's a lot of project management software that can really help keep you on track um, especially if you're doing major construction projects for, per se um, and even with that uh, if you're in say sales you want to be able to manage the customers you speak with. So Salesforce is an example of a software program you would use to manage your customers. So every time you talk with a customer, you make notes of who that customer is, what their business is, what their interests are. Do they have kids? Do they have a wife? And you can make notes. So when you follow up with them again in six months, you can go back into your Salesforce software, pull up their customer's name, and boom, you can have everything you've talked to them about, what their interests are right there in front of you, which is a key point when you're a salesperson. Uh, so make sure you're utilizing any software to help you along the way as well. And you want to involve all the appropriate stakeholders. So how many other, do you have business partners? Um, do you have employees that are, say, family? Like, Are you going to have your, your son or daughter or your wife help you in the store or help you with your business? Well, you want to include them as part of your feasibility study and make sure they're included in your decision making process as well. So feasibility study is basically doing your own due diligence. It's your homework. It's being able to say I've researched the market, I've researched my capabilities, I've researched the competition, I've come up with some financial projections of what I could possibly make. And then you with all of that data collected, that's when you can make a, a no or a no go or a no go decision. Maybe you look at all the data and say, hey, I don't really want to open a restaurant anymore because the market doesn't really support it. And getting into a restaurant is a lot of low profits. And I'll be working all the time on the weekends and evenings. And that's not necessarily what I, where I want to be. So you want to make sure you're taking everything. In. That, that's the point of a feasibility study is that you're taking all this data, analyzing it, and then making a go, no-go decision about your business or the new direction that your business wants to go. 
So I know we're getting to the end. And so that's what I have for you today. So I wanted to wrap that up. I thought it was, again, a lot of info thrown at you, but I think it's some important info uh, if you're putting, if you're at the starting stages of your business and you're trying to put together some plans and research uh, whether or not you have a feasible business. These are the elements that you're going to want to have. And if you're looking to get funding, you want to have a business plan and you're going to need to include those elements. So I'll open it up for a question uh, in a Q&A. And please, there's my contact info there as well. If you're not on LinkedIn, it's a great marketing or a networking tool uh, to market yourself. So please get on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. So thank, you. Let me your way. thank you so much. I know um, Ken has a question in the chat box, but I have... But this goes back to um, the presentation earlier on, because right away, like I wondered when you talked about business plan, uh, I remember I wrote one 14 years ago, like I'd actually have to go get it and like blow the dust off it. So it's that old. So how, what would you recommend? Like how, um, how, how should we be updating our business plan? Like thoughts on that? Yeah, the standard benchmarking for updating your business plan is actually yearly, um, even more so sometimes. So some people will go back and look at, yeah, your business plan, that's something I should have mentioned. So thanks for bringing that up, Michelle. Your business plan should actually be a working document. Uh, so you don't want to get stuck in the thing like, hey, I made this business plan last year and this is what I have to do to follow this. It's like, no. No, being an entrepreneur is very fluid. Things change. Um, uh, your pro decision making process might change with new information you get along the way, which is all going to affect how you want to run your business. So your business plan should be a working document, a fluid document that you want to be looking at reviewing at least once a year if, if you're utilizing it. But again, remember, I, I, I did make that disclaimer. You'll find a lot of entrepreneurs who don't use a business plan or don't have one. So it all depends on what your needs are as a business. Like I said, most businesses, if you need to secure funding, they're going to want to see some sort of business plan. Awesome. Okay, so Ken, um, and we're going to read this out just for the sake of those who are catching this on the replay, because um, they won't be able to see this. So Ken is saying, you mentioned that you generate leads. So he's saying, you should be aware that Canada Post on a continuous basis offers five-year contracts for small, medium vehicle transportation one or more vehicles, one or more drivers, one or more routes. So best way to monitor these contracts is to sign up on Arriba. I don't know if I'm saying that right, as a seller under the category of transportation. Very interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. oh, that's an interesting tidbit. Yep. Thanks for sharing that, Ken. Uh, it's uh, Ken. Actually, uh, if you go on Arriba if you, uh, for market research uh, uh, as a seller, and you put in the category, say, I want to sell socks, um, you know, uh, fancy socks like Justin wears. So uh, I just put in socks and I, I register as a seller. And so I get notifications of anybody that's looking forward to, to wanting to uh, buy socks, you know, and generally it's, uh, you know, it's not it's not just uh, one pair of socks. It's, you know, like I want, uh, you know, a, a couple of thousand pairs of socks uh, on a regular basis on a long term contract. So. Mm -hmm. So Reba's, Reba's a great uh, one. Now, um, uh, Elsie would know, and I guess Tara would know as well, uh, Canada Post is hoping to uh, make a presentation on some of its uh, its offerings and, and some of its plans in the future. I'm not sure when that's coming up, but uh, hopefully Tara and Elsa, Elsie may uh, may uh, have more information on that. But uh, so the, uh, Arriva is a great, uh, uh, a great uh, um, and it's easy, uh, relatively easy to, uh, to sign up for Arriva. Uh, as a seller, uh, and it's and it's free. Okay, a great possible resource. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Ken. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much again. I took I, I was took a lot of notes. Um, you just brought a really great knowledge. And again, these webinars are really about building the capacity and, and giving us the tools to do what we need to do to follow. You know that. Um, path creator has set us on so thank you so much for being here it was an honor to have you here and we wish you so much more success as you go on your endeavors so thank you so much for being here and yeah, everyone else, 
we're honored that you showed up on a, it's a hot day here in a Miskwachewa sky again. So I don't know where you are at, but I hope you are able to enjoy the sunshine, whether that's literal or metaphorical in your world. So, you know, take a, take a moment and, and notice that sun and notice the goodness of creator. So we'll see you again. Be well, take care. Well, I'll be everybody. Take care.